This is the Truth Frequency Radio Network. We are TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no bias. America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again here on TruthFrequencyRadio.com, 90.7 FM in Denver. Glad to be back with you on another Tuesday afternoon, wherever you are across this great nation or around the world, and also would like to belatedly wish you a happy Memorial Day. Those of us in the United States celebrated Memorial Day yesterday. And uh, most of us, I'm sure, had a great time in doing so. And I suppose it's something that is uh, genuinely American about us. That we in our nation and we in our our culture have a tendency to lose sight of the real meaning of our holidays. We're always up to celebrate. We're always up to have a good time. For practically any excuse. But man, when it comes to our most important holidays, we, we seem to we seem to take our eye off the ball a little bit and forget awfully quick why we're cel- celebrating them and, and, and what the bloody point is. You think of Christmas, you know, and we get all wrapped up in presents, so to speak. And parties and all kinds of events that go on and all of these things and the hustle and the bustle and the travel and the getting the gifts and paying for them and wrapping them and taking them here and there and getting certain members of the family here and certain members over there and you go through all of that and pretty quickly we have a tendency at christmas time to forget that we're celebrating the birth of our lord and savior jesus christ as a culture that tends to be forgotten about ignored or or even in some cases buried as as though we don't want to celebrate that we forget the meaning of the holiday when we have thanksgiving in our nation which we celebrate here in america in in november i know our canadian friends celebrate it another time but here here in the states we do it in november right towards the end of college football season (laughs) we start we start thinking about the food and getting together the family and watching football and maybe even starting those Black Friday or Black Thursday sales for Christmas. And we forget that what we're actually supposed to be celebrating is our forefathers' brave journey to the new world and how they defied incredible odds to establish their culture here. And to give that culture and and share that culture with the Indians and better their lives. And how all of us together built this great nation from virtually nothing. That's what Thanksgiving is supposed to be about. But we often forget that. We get wrapped up in the food and the football and, and everything else. We're looking for a reason to celebrate, but we always forget why. And Cinco de Mayo, why the Sam Hill do we even celebrate Cinco de Mayo? I have no idea, but but I guess that's another one. I find that Memorial Day is a holiday an awful lot like that. It has, over the years, it has become the unofficial start of summer. We get the barbecue grill out for the first time. We get the kids outside to play for one of the first times. We fill up the pool for the first time. We have friends over outdoors for the first time. We do all those things for the first time on or around Memorial Day. We cook out. We do all those things. And we have a good time. We drink a little bit and have some good barbecue. We have a great time. But how often on Memorial Day do we forget that what we are actually celebrating are the lives and the sacrifices of those brave men and women who have gone into our military 
and have paid the ultimate price while our military has been a force for good the world over for over 200 years while our military has overcome insurmountable odds all over the world to move forth this great American culture and way of life so that every corner of the globe can see it and experience it and a lot of people have made an ultimate sacrifice for that and Memorial Day yesterday was supposed to be a day in which we do not allow those lives to have been sacrificed in vain. It is supposed to be a day that we remember these people and, and how they made our country great, why they made our country great, how they protected us, and how they put forth the greatness that is America, the exceptionalism that is America, and have put it forth through the world so that everybody might benefit. We often forget that. We often forget, be it Memorial Day or any other day, we often forget that without our military, without our army, our Marines, our Navy, our Air Force, without our armed forces, this nation would be nothing. This nation would be a sitting duck. We could not be the most free country in the world. We could not be the most prosperous country in the world. We could not be the proverbial shining city on a hill that all of the downtrodden and the rest of the world come to to make a life for themselves. We could not be that. We would never have had the opportunity. So it's on days like this that we should think of our military and, and praise them and, and reflect on what it means for what they've done. And as we do that, I, I look back now at something we've talked about in this program a few times, the what we call around here the presidential battle royal, where everybody's throwing their hat into the ring for this 2016 presidential race. And over the last couple of weeks, there has been a question that a lot of liberal journalists, and even some even some not-so-liberal journalists, have put towards the Republican presidential candidates regarding the military, regarding the actions of our military, regarding our decisions with the military within the last decade and a half or so. And it has been a question that has been problematic, I suppose, for some candidates in their efforts to be everything to everyone in their efforts to say what they mean but not sound controversial lest they lose the nomination, lest they lose a vote. It is the question of, was invading Iraq a mistake? Simple question, it would seem like. But when it has been posed to Republican presidential candidates over the last couple of weeks, it has become problematic. It has resulted in some flip-flops. It has resulted in candidates in front of a microphone doing more dancing around than a Britney Spears backup dancer. Often leading to some very confusing exchanges and confusing answers. And at the end of the segment, you're just not really sure what the candidate said. I've got a brief montage here to show you what I'm talking about. I've got three clips here. The first two are of Jeb Bush, a man who is allegedly the Republican party front runner even though i can't seem to find a republican anywhere who wants to vote for him but we're told he's a front runner it's two clips one of which where bush says that going into iraq was the right thing to do and then another one right after it where he says it was not and then the third and final clip i have here is marco rubio in an exchange recently with fox news uh fox news sunday reporter chris wallace or anchor chris wallace i guess where Wallace tries to catch him up in that little argument. So here are two clips from Jeb Bush, one clip from Marco Rubio demonstrating to you how problematic the question of Iraq is for the current crop of GOP presidential candidates. On the subject of Iraq, yep. obviously very controversial, knowing what we know now, would you have authorized the invasion? I would have, and so, so would have Hillary Clinton, just to remind everybody, and so would have almost everybody that was confronted with the intelligence they got. Knowing what we know now, what would you have done? I would have not engaged, I would not have gone into Iraq. Senator, isn't that a flip? Six weeks ago, 
it made sense to invade Iraq in 2003. Now you say it was a mistake. No, two different questions. It was not a mistake. The president, based on, this is the way the real world works, the president, based on the information that was provided... But she was him, saying, based yeah, on the information... Said, no, no, but look, there's... She was saying, based on the inf what we know now. Well, <laughs> based on what we know now, a lot of them, based on what we know now, I wouldn't have, you know, thought Manny Pacquiao was going to beat uh, in, that, in, in that fight a couple know, of weeks you, ago. I know, but you were asked the same question, and you said it no, it was not the same. No, it was not the same question. Okay, so there you've heard some flip-flops, there you've heard some dancing around, there you've heard some splitting of hairs from these two candidates. And I'm not singling out strictly Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio. There have been other candidates recently who have uh, answered these questions in similar ways. Uh, I, I used Bush and Rubio out of convenience. They were the easiest audio to get, but they have not been alone on this by any stretch. But the answers to these questions, to me, demonstrate the disgusting side, if you will, of politics to me. Because to me, both of these men, and, and the others whom we did not take the time to, to put their audio on the air, these candidates who are trying to dance around this question and answer it in a way that will please everybody, they're missing the point. They're taking what should be a very simple issue and turning it into an unnecessarily complex one. They're taking what should be a very obvious and easy answer and making more of it than it really is. Making the proverbial mountain out of a molehill. Making a meal of it, as our friends across the pond in England might say. Taking something that should be an obvious answer and making it far more complex than it need be as not to offend anybody. Well, in case you are considering the question of should we have gone into Iraq knowing what we do to know today, I will give you momentarily the correct answer to that question. Now, I would preface this by saying and reminding you as I've told you from day one since I've been on Truth Frequency Radio, and for those of you who have followed me longer on the old YouTube America's Evil Genius Show, the archives of which are still available at youtube.com slash America's Evil Genius, as I've told you even from the days of that show, I am not a politician and I never intend on being one. I will never come on to this radio show, or I will never go on to a commercial or I will never go on to television, or I will never go on to the internet and ask you for your vote. That will never happen. I'm not that guy. I'm the guy who's here to teach and explain and to demonstrate. I am not the guy who's here to kowtow to anyone. Point of that is, I do not have any incentive to tell you what you want to hear. The incentive I have is to tell you the truth. Whether you are comfortable with the truth or not is somewhat irrelevant. It is not a concern to me. I come out here to give you the news of the day and to interpret for you the major events of our time, truthfully, honestly, and with clear-headedness and a clear vision, whether you like it or not, that's what I do. I tell you that to set up the fact that since I'm not asking for your vote, since I'm not asking you for a donation, since I'm not asking you to donate money to my non-existent presidential campaign, since I'm not asking you to put out yard signs for me, since I'm not asking you to go door to door and ask people to vote for me, but in effect, I do not have to kiss up to you. And if your preconceived notions about any particular issue happen to be wrong, happen to be incorrect, I do not bear the burden of constructing an answer to a question for you that will make you comfortable 
Instead, if you're wrong, I can call you out on being wrong. That's something that I guess are the current aspirations. Marco Rubio and Jed Bush and whomever else just can't seem to do right now. They can't have the guts and the gumption to walk up to people and say, hey, you're wrong. Because it might cost them a vote. Or it might cost them, more importantly at this point, some, some money, some donations. A war chest, if you will. So now that you see that my perspective in this situation, my dog in the hunt, if you will, is different than those you are hearing from, perhaps you will better understand my answer to the question of knowing what we know now, should we have gone into Iraq? Because my answer to the question is this. Knowing what we know now, hell yes, we should have gone into Iraq. In fact, I would not go so far as these politicians and these reporters and journalists are going and putting all kinds of caveats onto the question or caveats onto the answer of, well, knowing what we knowing what we knew then, we should have, but knowing what we know now, we shouldn't have. No, 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 I'm not going to split hairs that way. Because to me, there are no qualifiers for it. Knowing what we knew in 2001, yes, we should have gone into Iraq. But knowing what we know today in 2015, yes, we still should have gone in to Iraq. We did nothing wrong. Now, I know when I say that, that's going to be very unpopular. I know that as we stand here today in 2015, the conventional wisdom among most Americans is that Iraq was a mistake. Was that it was unjustified? Was it that we should not have been there? Well, I'm here to tell you the conventional wisdom, and yes, even the opinion of the majority of the American people in 2015, even the, Amer the majority of the American people on this issue are wrong. They are incorrect. And they must be called on the carpet for it. They must be re-educated. The American people must be corrected on this issue. Now here's why I say that. Here is why I have the opinion that I have on this. The first thing that so many opponents of the Iraq War will tell you today is that it was sold to us in terms of weapons of mass destruction. And since we supposedly never found weapons of mass destruction, that completely implodes and destroys the credibility for the war. That's the mistake. That's the big mistake, as far as a lot of people say. And it's true, the American media spent so much time and effort and energy beating the drum that supposedly there were no weapons of mass destruction. Not even taking into account how asinine it is that the news just comes up one day and just out of nowhere it says, oh, we've discovered there were no weapons of mass destruction. And you say, well, what did you do? Did you, did you search a whole country? That, did, did you go over that whole country with a fine tooth comb? Okay, that's not even logically possible. But that's the story we got a few years back. But lo and behold, what has come out since then, which has not been emphasized by the media, although it has been, it has been reported in very subtle tones, it has, but it's not been emphasized. What has come out is that, yes, there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And yes, they were discovered. Let that sink in for a second. Those of you who are running around saying there were no WMDs, you are wrong. There were WMDs. The supposedly flawed intelligence we had at the time turned out to be correct. We did not go into Iraq on false pretenses. The WMDs were found. We did the right thing. Don't believe me? Here's some proof. The New York Times, a newspaper that is anything but a conservative cheerleader, a newspaper that was on the forefront of the anti-war effort at the time, 
a newspaper that was very critical of George W. Bush for going into Iraq. Even they reported, even the New York Times reported, that about 5,000 chemical warheads, shells, or aviation bombs were found scattered across Iraqi soil. 5,000 chemical weapons, shells, or aviation bombs across Iraq. And even the New York Times said it. So yes, there were WMDs. That means that if you're someone out there harping against the war because you say there were no WMDs, you lose your credibility right away. The WMDs existed. Even the uh, WikiLeaks documents showed the same thing. August 2004, American forces surreptitiously purchased what they believed to be containers of liquid sulfur mustard. It's used in the chemical weapon. Troops tested the liquid. They reported two positive results for the blister, the blister agent that is what does the job there. Nearly three years later, American troops were still finding WMDs in the region. An armored Buffalo vehicle unearthed a cache of artillery cell shells that were covered by sacks and leaves under the Iraqi Community Watch checkpoint. The 155 millimeter rounds are filled with an unknown liquid, and several of which are leaking a black tar-like substance. Initial tests were inconclusive, but later the rounds tested positive for mustard. Hey, look, more proof of WMDs. From New York Magazine, between 2004 and 2011, American troops and Iraqi police officers repeatedly found chemical weapons produced by Saddam Hussein's regime before 1991. And at least 17 U.S. service members were wounded by deteriorating shells filled with nerve and mustard agents. The men suffered burns, severe blisters, respiratory problems, and other long-lasting health problems. But the U.S. government prevented the troops from receiving medical care and refused to recognize that they had been wounded in the line of duty. To make matters worse, ISIS now controls the area where most of the weapons were found. So not only were there WMDs, and that's been proven, but our current enemies today may very well have a hold of them. So the WMDs existed. They were real. And while it's true that the intelligence that we went to war off of was flawed to some degree, and all intelligence is flawed to some degree, you know, no intelligence is perfect. You know, in military endeavors just as in the rest of life, you cannot make decisions on complete information. We very rarely do that in any aspect of life. You have to go to you have to make decisions in your life based on what information is available and how credible it is. And while it is true that in, that uh, intelligence was flawed in terms of maybe how old the WMDs were, how many they were, maybe precisely where they were, the intelligence was correct in terms of the existence of the WMDs. So our justification for war with Iraq was correct. But I would go even further. Even if WMDs had never been found, I would say that our foray into Iraq was justified for this very simple reason. As we stand here today in May of 2015, if you'll look around, you will notice that Saddam Hussein is still out of power and Saddam Hussein is still dead. For those two reasons alone, it was right to go into Iraq and do what we did. And after 9-11, it had to happen. Now, some of you are saying, well, Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with 9-11. Oh, yes, they did. Perhaps not in a direct sense. But we were not attacked by a country on 9-11. We were not even attacked specifically by Al-Qaeda on 9-11, which seems to be the fatal sticking point, the fatal flaw that a lot of people have in their logic. We were attacked by a culture on September 11, 2001. Yes, we were even attacked by a religion. And when those of us who justify the invasion into Iraq and the deposing of Saddam Hussein and the execution of Saddam Hussein do so on the basis of 9-11, we're so often confronted with people saying, well, why don't you go into this country or that country? Why don't you go into Syria? Why don't you go here? Why don't you go here? There. My answer to them is, we should. Given enough time, we should. See, Iraq was not the end point for 9-11. It was the starting point. We seem to have lost track of that now. We seem to have lost sight of that. But on 9-11-2001, it was clear to me and to most other Americans on that day that the Middle East needed a house cleaning. 
As Ann Coulter herself said one time, invade their countries, kill their leaders, and convert them to Christianity. That was the correct answer in 2001. That is still the correct answer in 2015. We must have a Manifest Destiny version 2.0 in the Middle East that uproots their backwards, incorrect, dangerous culture and replaces it with Western culture. They must not have a choice. We must deliver to them freedom, whether they want it or not. We must deliver to them Western values and Christianity, whether they want it or not. At the end of the day, it makes no difference if someone accepts a positive culture because they wish to do so or because it happens at the end of a gun. It just has to happen. We, as Americans, are better off because Saddam Hussein is dead. Now, what we didn't do was we did not go far enough to make sure that he was replaced by someone or something that was positive. That's the next step, not only in Iraq, but the rest of the Middle East. Our only problem in invading Iraq was not that we did it, but it's that we did not go far enough. That we did not deliver to Iraq and the rest of the Middle East the destruction and the violence, which is the only way you can communicate with those people. We must remember that if we're going to be safe going forward. Folks, that's the first segment. We'll be back with the second half of the Power Hour here right after this. <laughs> 